welcome everyone to the second session of our conference, Collective Memory, Genocides and International Law. And during this session, we'll have an opportunity to hear three excellent researchers that will tell us a little bit more about an international law perspective uh, on, the purpose, uh, on the possibilities of preserving memory in historical context. And uh, maybe uh, at first, I would just like to say that each of our speakers will have around 15 minutes for uh, their speech, and then hopefully we we'll have a time for fruitful discussion. So uh, to begin, I would like to give a microphone to Professor uh, Michal Balcezak, who is an associate professor at the Human Rights Department, Faculty of Law and Administration at Nicolas Copernicus University in Toronto, in Poland, and who is also enrolled in the list of ad hoc judges of the European Court of Human Rights. And he will present a speech on memory of genocide and other international crimes from the perspective of public international law and the protection of human rights. Professor Barsajak, please begin. Thank you, Doctor. And uh, thank you for having me here. I would also like to say hello to all participants and panelists. Um, well, uh, when it comes to the perspective of international law, as well as uh, protection of, of human rights, uh, actually, we should start from, uh, I think, the, the following um, first point. Of course, um, the concept of genocide and the concept of, for instance, crimes against humanity as such, those two concepts were, in fact, born in the framework of um, international law. Uh, and uh, so my first point is that obviously international law remembers. Uh, it is international law which considered this found founding, uh, let's say, ground for these uh, concepts to be uh, formulated, developed. And um, I think that uh, our panelists and actually all those um, uh, interested in these matters might be familiar with the uh, book of Philip Sands, which is entitled uh, East West Street, about the the, the two um, well extremely um, important personalities of the 20th century, Professor Herr Lautepacht and Raphael Lemkin, uh, who themselves might have never met. That's not proven that they've ever met, but both, um, in, in a way, originated from from Lviv, um, uh, Lviv, if you wish. And um, in fact, they were the uh, main uh, um, figures when it comes to the development, Professor Lemkin, when it comes to the development of the concept of genocide, Professor Herr Schlauterpacht, when it comes to crimes against um, humanity. Uh, and now the international law provided this, uh, these concepts. Now the question is whether international law also can serve as a certain um, basis to uh, protect and preserve a certain correct narrative or simply speaking whether international law can be useful in protecting the truth about genocides, well, acts of genocide and, 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 and crimes. You know, we sometimes use the, um, the notion narrative, uh, which is in fact uh, useful as well, but what we are discussing here is not only the narrative, it is also a matter of, of truth. But also, um, next thing is that the actually whole system of international law, as we when we look at it after 1945, was developed uh, with a very strong reference to the atrocities of the Second World War. Uh, also, the, when we see at the preamble of the United Nations Charter, it's very obvious that drafters of the Charter, the, also the peoples of United Nations, had that in mind. When we see the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and uh, of the Crime of Genocide, that's also quite obvious. Um, but also you could, and we could legitimately ask, is it all? Is it so that international law provided this framework and left it uh, for, for states, left it for other stakeholders, and didn't care what happens next. But not necessarily. Well, one thing which also requires to be, um, uh, say, well, requires to, to, to be said is that um, uh, international law uh, deals uh, with responsibilities, as every system of law. Um, and uh, it's important for every lawyer and everybody to, to know whose responsibility we have in mind. Uh, 
um, because uh, the discussions narratives about genocide crimes against humanity are of course a matter of um, a discussion and a matter of of various narratives some are state sponsored some some are private uh, opinions and debates and so on so um, when it comes to uh, state responsibility of course that's it's certain that that has been uh, done and that has been regulated now the issue is whether responsibility for um, saying uh, untruths for uh, negating uh, certain truths about um, genocide and, and state uh, and uh, crimes against humanity whether international law goes that far also to um, provide any obligations for states to prevent, to react, um, and what can be done um, about it. So, um, again, international law did not remain idle uh, when we see um, how, it, uh, how it started. Uh, I mean, international law after 1945, because it's, of course, the law of nations as such is, is much older. Uh, and, but nevertheless, um, it developed also the systems of state responsibility and individual responsibility. Um, uh, but what I have, so to say, uh, discovered or found out after I researched this particular question is that it is hard to identify um, or even impossible to identify treaty obligations or universal legal norms at the level of international law, which would conclusively and categorically um, ensure that states should uh, correct or prevent and prosecute for, uh, for wrong, uh, uh, wrong perception or for conveying um, uh, well, the, the wrong narrative about these crimes. Even though in, in international law, we, of course, we, uh, we use uh, conventions, we use treaty law, we also use uh, customary law, which is equally important in the, in the sphere of international law. Customary law takes, uh, we look at the state practice, we looked at opinion juris, whether this established practice developed into uh, a norm of customary law. But actually, I don't think that it happened. In other words, um, I have not seen such a strong, solid basis to identify um, such uh, norms of international law. But having said that, uh, certain uh, international treaties, certain conventions, did provide for uh, some form of, of course, of uh, protecting memory, sometimes in bilateral relations. Um, uh, this um, I'm now referring to, for instance, Polish-German treaty um, from the early 90s, which indeed also referred to places of, of memory, to certain preservation of, um, of certain sites, etc. Um, so now the question is, perhaps we expect too much of international law. Uh, maybe we have some you know, expectations which cannot be fulfilled because states, in fact, uh, have certain interests uh, and state, states decide what they want to constitute the obligations between them. Um, even though we could probably argue that the correct narrative about genocide and, um, and international crimes, that it is in the interest of states, or at least most states, uh, to have such uh, correct narrative, um, that's not enough. I mean, the debate about states' interests is one thing, but what are the, out what are the um, actual um, norms and obligations? It's a, it's a different story. So maybe international law disappointed us. But here, uh, we should also mention um, um, international human rights law, because um, that's again a certain history of success. Uh, it's been extensively developed after 1945, 1948, Universal Declaration, etc. Um, and now let's uh, just uh, uh, let's try to look at it from uh, from this perspective. In other words, um, the um, memory of uh, genocides and uh, international crimes um, is something which uh, was not necessarily directly covered by international human rights law but also uh, but on the other hand 
Mm, the, the question is whether or not um, there is some reaction from the part of human rights when somebody um, oversteps a certain boundaries, oversteps the protected area of uh, freedom of expression. So again, um, uh, that's first and foremost the decision of the national lawmaker and the domestic system, how the domestic system responds. But now the question is, what about this exercise of freedom of speech when somebody mm, uh, uses um, freedom of expression mm, and um, in fact denies uh, genocide, holocaust, denies crimes? So in that, in that regard, we would need to refer to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights and uh, that is a very important point of reference. Uh, to cut a long story short, um, the denialism, the negation of Holocaust is absolutely not protected by the freedom of expression by Article 10 of the Convention. Let us recall that both Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights and Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights both deal with the freedom of expression. They also include a very important reminder which is, I think it's the last sentence of in both treaties, they refer to duties and responsibilities which go along exercising free speech. That's an important reminder and it is in fact obvious that exercising free speech is not absolute, there are certain limitations. So um, denying Holocaust does not um, benefit from any protection under the European Convention on Human Rights. The question is whether some other, um, uh, well, uh, statements, some other uh, incorrect, false uh, narratives, whether concerning genocide or international crimes, whether, um, whether those benefit from such protection. And here the answer is a bit nuanced. There was the case of Perinchek versus Switzerland, where in fact, uh, um, prosecuting uh, for um, denying the Armenian genocide um, was uh, considered a violation of Article 10. In other words, um, well, uh, domestic law, which also um, in, the, in that respect was, was relevant. Some states indeed went that far also to, to punish for um, mis- well, incorrect statements also concerning other acts of, of genocides and that was evaluated in the case law of the of the Euro European court which was to, there was the grand chamber judgment and it wasn't actually a clear-cut um, judgment but um, we see that there are some struggles there are some hesitations um, I would uh, I would need a bit more time to to develop these issues but um, in fact, um, I don't think that we have, um, um, let's say, a very clear uh, situation uh, as regards also um, this limits of protection of freedom of expression when it comes to uh, other potential um, uh, cases where false, untruth information were, were provided or opinions. Um, you know, on the one hand, the European Court of Human Rights says that it protects also the statements which shock, offend or disturb that we should cherish and, and we should benefit from this wide freedom of expression. But on the other hand, I do believe that there are limits to this approach that also um, European human rights law should serve as uh, a certain um, and should be, let's say, guided by a certain rule of reason in that respect and a certain interpretation of uh, Article 10 of the Convention should um, allow it. Uh, I know that my time actually, I think, expired. Um, I would just like to conclude by saying that um, the response of international law and international human rights law to, um, well, issues concerning uh, memory of genocides and other international crimes, uh, this um, response might be disappointing but I think that um, it is up to certain approaches, up to certain philosophy of the freedom of expression um, where we could find uh, some, some solutions. And uh, 
uh, in essence, uh, I would argue that it's not a, a closed chapter and, and, and we could expect certain developments also in the field of international law and uh, human rights. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Bacajak. Well, hopefully we'll have still time during our discussion to maybe expand on some topic that you mentioned in your uh, speech. But now I would like to uh, give a voice to Professor Paweł Wilinski, who is a professor of law and chief of the Department of Criminal Procedure at Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan, Poland, and who is also a judge of the Supreme Court of Poland. And he will introduce us with a lecture on fighting for true achievement and limitations of international criminal law in preserving memory of genocide and other international crimes. Professor Wilinski, you have the voice. Thank you very much. Um, good morning to everybody. I would like to uh, say thank you to Professor Radvan and Dr. Horonjak for inviting me for the conference. This morning session showed us how interesting it is. Uh, although I have the longest title uh, among all other speakers, um, luckily I have only 15 minutes uh, to present that. So I will concentrate only on some, some selected comments on relations between truth and international crimes. Um, I would like to say that fighting for truth is uh, in international law is the essence of all efforts that we can do to bring justice back to victims and societies. But I would like to start with um, some lesson that I received from my students that uh, brought me to the conclusion about reasons and goals of the international criminal law. Uh, teaching uh, course of international criminal law for over 20 years for uh, students from all over the world, I received many useful lessons from them. Every year I ask those students the same question. If they know and can present example from their own history of any act of genocide, war crimes, crime against humanity committed by or with the uh, attendance of their own uh, countrymen or the country itself. They can go back uh, in history as far as they want. List of those uh, accidents um, is always very long and uh, except some obvious and well-known events from 20th century like the Holocaust, Shoah with Auschwitz as a symbol of the humanization of Armenian genocide mentioned today three times, German and Nazi and other Nazi atrocities in Europe, Russian atrocities against our nations and their own nation, the Rwandan genocide, Cambodia, Sierra Leone case, the crimes against Yugoslavia, from Yugoslavia, Spanish civil war, English concentration camps, for Boers in South Africa, Japanese crimes in China, Hovodomori in Ukraine. I always, <clears throat> I always receive new examples, not very well new to me. And uh, I want to share with you some examples from this year, this October discussion. One is from Spain, one from Belgium, and one is the Finnish experience. Uh, the first one, the action that was officially called the final solution and was organized in Spain in 18th century against gypsies. There was an act of extermination of gypsy population in Spain by means of imprisonment and separation between men and women in order to avoid their procreation. But uh, it is estimated that they had about 9,000 gypsies uh, as victims of this. The Belgium experience is connected to colonization of Burundi shortly after the Second World War and the politic of divide and conquer that, as we all know, resulted 50 years later in dividing in the, the, the Burundis into Tutsi and Hutu and the Rwandan genocide. The third one, uh, probably most <clears throat> interesting for me, because I have never ever heard about this, the Finnish experience, 
Oh, um, what's the description by the Finnish student about acts of ethnic discrimination, extermination and concentration camps organized by Finnish for Russian soldiers and civil population in Finland? That was a Tampere case in 1918 about uh, 10,000 Russians, mainly factory workers and surrender soldiers gathered at the square of Tampere. Uh, 100 or 1000 of them was executed on site and the rest was sent to uh, concentration concentrating camps for one reason they estimated that this group is too big to be shot all of them and they were sent to to, to camps and there is a history of uh, refugees and uh, actions against civil um, civil Russian uh, civilian from Russian from 1941 and 1943. Why I say that, uh, and that this is a lesson, what a lesson <clears throat> can we have from that? We can have at least that a lesson that human history is a history of cruelty and atrocities. And no nation or country is free from that. And denying own atrocities by countries was before and is now also the main factor limiting development of international criminal law and is obviously no, not the way forward. We can observe that even today when we see the discussion about opening investigation in Afghanistan before the international criminal law. Um, as I believe there is no free market of truth in this field, responding to what Professor Radvan said today. But um, I think that all players, countries, VIPs, organizations, uh, they try to convince us on their own vision of history and truth. That's why preserving memory of those crimes, of the necessity of responsibility, are reasons and goals for evolution of international criminal law. Um, speaking about the genocide, um, mentioning Rafał Lemkin, um, we can remember that in his book from 1944, there was just 14 pages describing us in chapter nine, the, 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 the crime called by him uh, genocide from Greek genos and Latin side. Uh, he created this term genocide, very short, very useful, and uh, Sam says that that's one of the reasons why it was so uh, famous uh, in some future. However, <clears throat> I believe that not everyone knows that uh, the first time um, that term genocide was used in trial, not at the Nuremberg trial, as we sometimes think, but as a legal term, it was used by the Polish genocide trials of German criminal Arthur Greiser and Austrian Amon Gott in 1946. They were for crimes committed in Poland on their own citizens. And that time, Lemkin's, Lemkin's understanding of organized at large scale actions, atrocities, we would say, against national groups, was used by prosecutors to describe special case of both of them. Arthur Greiser, just to mention in short, he was a German commander of Varta country and he was responsible for Germanization, extermination of Polish and Jewish population uh, from the subordinate area. His uh, trial took place in Poznań, my, my city, uh, in 1946. And the second one, born in Vienna, Amon Gott, he was the commander of the Plaszow concentration camp and liquidator of the Jewish ghetto in Krakow and Tarnow. He was uh, personally accused about for over 500 acts of murder and responsible for over 9,000, 10,000 victims in his camp. He was sentenced to death in 1946. And in both cases, there was a genocide using as a, a legal term for the first time as to my uh, knowledge. Why the genocide from the international criminal law is a shameful crime. I call it shameful crime uh, 
because we <clears throat> we all and international community was for decades and sometimes we can see that also afraid of using term genocide describing atrocities it's much easier to find the prosecution based of on crimes against humanity or description of the act without using the term genocide. The, the, the change have been made before the Rwandan tribunal, which I will speak later on, and the uh, Yugoslavian tribunal. But before that, if we look at the history of international criminal, uh, international criminal courts, we can see that apart, underst of underst and the, apart the understanding of the term genocide and necessity of um, of prosecuting the genocide, we couldn't find the verdicts and the judgments based on finding someone guilty of genocide. According to American sociologist and historian Michael Mann, genocide is the most extreme degree of intergroup violence and the most extreme of all acts of ethnic cleansing. And that's maybe the reason why it's so hard to to say, yes, that was a genocide. This is also a part of the politic on the international level that we can observe and that have a huge influence on the international criminal law that this term genocide is a shameful crime. Um, <clears throat> what... Um, can we say about the um, genocide implementation into uh, international criminal law system? As I said, that was not mentioned in the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials. Uh, although these are both milestones in the evolution of international criminal justice system, and uh, we have to remember that some dreamers at that time believed that this is a beginning of permanent court. We have to re also remember that deficiency, deficiencies of the Nuremberg, trial, tr Nuremberg trials and Tokyo trials uh, resulted in the uh, next decades in the evolution of uh, international criminal law. We have to remember that um, although it's a milestone, it was also called the victor's justice. It was also always sensitive topic in discussion with uh, my students that were pointing uh, that the members of the panel, the judges representing countries like uh, United States or Soviet Union. The United States was never held responsible for Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Soviet Union was never held responsible for atrocities committed against millions of Polish, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Czechs, Russians, and their own citizens. One of the charges brought against the Nazi was conspiracy to commit uh, aggression against Poland in 1939, or Finland later on. But the Soviet Union attacked the Poland and other countries, like the Germans, and nobody from the Soviet Union was accused of that act. In Nuremberg, there was no responsibility for many atrocities that had happened at the same time that uh, those presented against Germany. Uh, but what is most important, that the justice was never really delivered. We have to remember that only 24 accused in main, main Nuremberg trial there were. Not much more in other Nuremberg trials. Uh, then we had trials in ex-occupied countries like Czechoslovakia, Poland, Yugoslavia, Soviet Union, but still no more than 5 to 7 percent of German, Austrian and other Nazi criminals were ever prosecuted. Shortly after the Iron Curtain cut to Europe, there were no more serious cooperation with prosecution of criminals. Uh, what is the result? The result is very serious because in countries like Poland that lost 6 million citizens and 90% of its industry, but other countries suffered similarly. Political failure to bring justice and prosecute for most cruel crimes committed on massive scale was considered by a society as another harm and left some sense of harm in, uh, in the country minds and their minds. And this shadow feeling could be found even today. 
The list of horrible crimes committed by German Nazi in Poland is so long that uh, it's hard to believe that it's really uh, that it's that it's true. Uh, there was never subject to any trial, and no one from criminals responded so long for that. So it seems impossible that it's true. For example, from the place where I am here today, uh, there is an extermination of 200. 200,000 civil inhabitants of capital city Warsaw in two months of, of 1944. And it is purpose, it, and uh, the purpose destruction of 90% of the city. There were no international trial, trials on that massacre and many others, but it was the same in Belarus, Belarus, Ukraine, Lithuania, Russia. It is therefore called, or I call that forgotten genocide from international criminal system. And one of the reasons why Polish seem to be so oversensitive for blaming them with the crimes of others is probably the result of this shadow feeling that, uh, that stayed after this lack of justice. And um, as my time is probably over. I will start with uh, the sad anecdote that I have heard just three days ago from a friend of mine, Polish judge, having having victims of German Nazi occupation in his uh, close family, uh, grandparents. He was uh, traveling a year ago to the United States and visiting Museum of Holocaust in one of uh, state museums. And uh, um, he was shocked with the reaction of the museum staff when he, um, being asked, he answered that he is from Poland. The, the, the staff was disgusted that someone from Poland, where Auschwitz is, had the courage and boldness to come here, um, as uh, if he would almost be responsible for that. So that shows that this shadow feeling and this lack of justice have uh, its strong consequences in the modern discussion of justice and modern evolution. From all of that, we can learn that the world will not ask us for the truth, but will draw conclusions from its lack of knowledge. The same, le the same lesson fits, in my opinion, to other situations and conflict. We see that in Rwandan conflict, we see that in Palestinian conflict, in current Syrian situation, in Congo situation, we see that and results of that when we discuss the case of Afghanistan and last December, the year ago, December discussion about opening prosecution against Afghanistan. The less we know about the situation and atrocities, the better for criminals and other avoidance of their responsibility. Thank you um, very much. Thank you, Professor Wilinski, for your input and for uh, telling us a bit, a bit more about those troubling limitations of, of uh, criminal international uh, law. And now I would like to uh, turn to the first speaker of our session, Dr. Dennis Lichtenstein, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Comparative Media and uh, Communication Studies at the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna and the University of Klagenfurt. And he will tell us and also show us a presentation on the subject of memory, identity, and legislative actions in European Union politics. Dr. Lichtenstein, please. Okay. Thank you very much. So I follow a communication science perspective on the politics of memory on the level of the European Union. So I'm interested in memory as part of European identity in the EU and how it is related to legislative action in EU politics. So the concept of European identity includes a sense of belonging to the EU, which is an important resource for loyalty, and a sense of togetherness with other EU member states as a resource for solidarity. Belonging and togetherness are related to frames of European identity, Identity frames emphasize a certain identity content. They establish a particular view of the EU, for instance, as a common market, as a currency union, or as a peace project. Several studies and several scholars have analyzed how European identity is constructed in public discourses on the level of the mass media. They found that national constructions of European identity differ according to national experiences, narratives, and interests. 
The since the countries, this allows to align national identity with the European project. However, different national constructions of European identity also lead to identity conflicts. While the mass media are an arena for the process of identity formation, official communication and, leg and legislative action have a determining power. Memory is an important part of identity frames in official communication. Official references to memory frequently aim to enhance a collectively shared understanding of European history that guides the way into a common future and can help to prevent conflicts between the member states. This means to face the past, but also to protect narratives, to promote democracy, and to integrate victims and marginals into the European society. Official statements also bear the danger of exclusion of member states and populations whose national identity is not consistent to official EU identity frames. Since the beginning of the Euro European project, the leitmotif in EU official communication is a memory of the tragic European past with a lesson to prevent further war. This narrative is universal and non-exclusive for all EU member states. It is complemented by anti-fascism, and since the 1990s, the EU integrated the Holocaust into its official memory as a warning of racism and ethnic conflicts. To not, to not exclude Germany from European identity, the Holocaust had to become a narrative of shared guilt. Austria, France, and other EU member states have recognized that parts of their political elites cooperated with the German Nazi regime. After EU in eastward enlargement in 2004, these markers of European identity became related to problems of inclusion. From Eastern European perspective, shared guilt during the Holocaust does not adequately represent the countries and is an obstacle for recognizing memory of the oppression. In the national memory cultures of many Eastern EU countries, Communism crimes and the notion of being victims of fascism and communist regimes prevails. Official engagement into identity constructions intensifies in times of crisis when belonging and togetherness must be stabilized. During the last decades, major crises concerning the euro, migration, right-wing populism and COVID-19 created a strong need for such a European identity and official engagement into identity construction. So against this backdrop, I propose two research, research questions. These are here. How was collective memory used in the official EU framing of identity during the decades of crisis? And how were memory-based identity resources transferred into legislative action? I conducted qualitative content analysis of EU documents for the time between 2009 and 2020 to examine the representation of memory in official EU identity frames. I analyzed speeches of the presidents of the European Commission. I selected spe speeches that were held due to an identity-related occasion, such as the annual State of the Union speeches. To study how memory-based identity resources were translated into legislative action, I analyzed res resolutions of the EU Parliament. Using keyword research, I identified and analyzed a total of 17 speeches and 35 resolutions. The coding followed an inductive summarizing approach with the main categories of identity frames, memory resources, and political claims. In the speeches held by the presidents of the European Commission, I found three main identity frames that describe the EU as an economic community, as a peace project, and as a community of human rights and freedom. The framing of the EU as an economic community highlights the common market, the euro, and the promise of economic wealth as identity markers. Accordingly, the history of the EU is a story of economic success to the benefit of all member states. It is about what we have gained together. The frame prevails in speeches during the global financial crisis and the beginning of the euro crisis that was a major threat for the economic, economic economic stability of the EU. 
to preserve the tradition of economic success, the frame calls for togetherness and for further developing of the EU institutions. The Frame Peace Project emphasizes war and nationalism as the antithesis of European identity. The EU is presented as a tool to overcome the nation states and as a guarantee for peace in the continent. Within the narrative of the peace community, dictatorships, the Holocaust, and the peaceful unification of Western and, European, uh, and Eastern Europe are mentioned, but this happens rather as side aspects. The Frame Peace Project gained prominence in 2011 uh, when the economic success frame lost power during the ongoing Euro crisis. The Frame is a reaction to growing right-wing populism, tendencies of nationalism, and international conflicts between the member states. It prevails during the migration and the COVID-19 crisis. The Peace Project Frame declares the stabilization of the EU in face of the crisis and the preservation of memory of the wars as historical duties. The frame Community of Human Rights and Freedom is an extension of the Peace Project frame, but it is more inclusive for the states in Central and Eastern Europe. The frame highlights the value of human and fundamental rights by reminding on times of suppression and fights for freedom in Europe. Accordingly, memory of freedom movements and revolutions and the fall of the Berlin Wall are in the center of European identity. The frame also puts emphasis on the right of asylum against the background of the long European history of forced migration. The frame is used during the migration crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, and against the backdrop of authoritarian developments in Poland and Hungary. It calls the member states to respect and not to undermine human rights and democracy. However, European Commission presidents avoid blaming individual governments, um, most importantly Poland and Hungary. Both frames, Peace Project Community and uh, the Community of Human Rights and Freedom, legitimize the EU as a role model and as a leading player in world politics. In the second step, I analyzed resolutions of the European Parliament to examine how memory-based identity resources are transferred into legislative action. It can be differentiated between resolutions that deal with foreign and pol domestic policy. In foreign policy, resolutions call the EU to promote peace, protect minorities, support freedom movements, and raise voice against authoritarian regimes. They are based on the identity resource of peace, human rights, and freedom. The resolutions claim that the EU should engage against violations of human rights in third countries. Several resolutions protest against Holocaust denial in Iran. In its neighborhood policy, the EU is called to contribute to the consolidation of democracies, to promote reform processes, enable free trade areas, and offer financial incentives, as well as a prospect of membership. Within the strategy, the relationship between the EU and Russia is crucial. Early resolutions want to include Russia in cooperation. More recent resolutions criticize Russia for an anachronistic thinking in spheres of influence, which is associated with a time of nationalism. In domestic policy, resolutions of the European Parliament call the EU to protect human rights and minority rights in its member states. Memory of war and the Holocaust are frequently mentioned identity resources. Resolutions contribute to memory and identity protection by critically reflecting on the state of human rights in the EU, most frequently with reference to the Treaty on European Union and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The resolutions point as at discrimination of minorities, limited media and information freedom, and threats resulting from neo-fascistic violence, hate speech, and Holocaust denial. Several resolutions directly criticize Hungary and Poland for violating EU treaties, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and thus principles of European identity. According to the European Parliament, this endangers the EU's external credibility and, most, and must be sanctioned by EU institutions. Several resolutions also contribute to identity constructions. One prominent issue is to sharpen awareness 
uh, for the history of the Roma as part of European culture. The European Parliament recognizes the genocide of the Roma during the Second World War. It demands for an international memorial day, a prohibition of denial of Roma Holocaust. Second, in its resolution, the European Parliament recognizes um, cr crimes committed by communist regimes. In 2019, for instance, it called for historical um, reappraisal of the suppression of the Romanian Revolution. Including crimes of communist regimes into a European memory, the European Parliament risks conflict with memory cultures in some member states. It also goes into confrontation with Russia. Russia is accused to glorify the Soviet totalitarian regime in its um, political propaganda and to, in, and to engage into an informational war against democratic Europe. So we can conclude that the presidents of the European Commission used collective memory in the framing of European identity as an important resource for stabilizing the EU in a decade of crisis. With growing internal tensions due to the crisis, they increasingly addressed collective memory as part of European identity. They shifted from economic identity frames to the memory of Europe's tragic past and fights for peace, human rights, and freedom. Over time, identity frames were aligned to major problems and crises in the EU, and thus changed. However, the presidents of the EU commissions retained the openness of European identity. Different from media discourses in their speeches, they used a low diversity of different identity frames, and that were rather non-controversial. They avoided conflicts with national memory cultures and an explicit blaming of single member states. And regarding the question of how collective identity is transferred into legislative action, we can conclude that identity is a tool to sharpen the EU's image as a political actor. It contributes to the legitimation of a common EU foreign and neighborhood policy that follows economic but also normative interests. Identity also legitimizes interventions in national domestic politics of the member states. And finally, Legislative actions push forward identity and memory construction with the integration of controversial aspects and the risk of identity conflicts between EU member states and the third countries. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lichtenstein. And uh, after all these speeches, I think we can finally uh, start our uh, joint discussion. And maybe at the beginning, I would just like to ask our speakers if maybe they have a questions for another speaker regarding their speeches or they want to add something that they hadn't had time during this speech. Okay, so, oh, Professor Barcera, can you see, please? Thank you very much. Well, I would perhaps not like to add to my speech. Well, I could, but um, I would like to use this time effectively for a comment and maybe share a question, but I'll be brief. Uh, well, one comment I would have, um, I listened carefully to uh, Professor Lichtenstein's uh, uh, presentation, and um, well, uh, it can be a comment, can be a question. Um, let, let's put it as a question. Um, of course, I am familiar with the idea of European identity and um, how is it shaped by the, by the EU, but would you agree or not uh, that perhaps the idea of European um, identity could be or should be considered a little broader? Uh, because, uh, well, as we know, European Union is not necessarily uh, organization which covers all European states. We also have Council of Europe, uh, and it, well, a separate um, international organization which is uh, sometimes confused with the European Union, although it shouldn't be. So, in essence, I was wondering, uh, maybe that's not necessarily something that um, is usually studied uh, at the same time or alongside, but uh, in case uh, that you might have any any 
a feedback also on, on that. I would be interested to know whether the European identity should not also be construed through the, let's say, political discourse within the Council of Europe as well. And my second um, question would be to Professor Wilinski, to Judge Wilinski. I also uh, I think that indeed um, it's extremely important field. I mean, the international criminal law that uh, um, is uh, well obviously a part of this uh, this debate. Um, but my question would be perhaps less uh, scholarly, or rather, would not uh, directly dwell on the on some details, um, I would rather like to, to ask whether, uh, Professor Wilinski, would, uh, would you say that um, international criminal law is also, in a, in a sense, um, I would say, a source of disappointment or not, when it comes to the correcting, the untruthful dis discourse or narrative? In other words, are you not disappointed uh, as a scholar, as a judge? Because sometimes I ask myself this question whether international human rights law should provide more or should be developed also in a, in a judicial uh, arena um, in a bit different fashion uh, in that regard. I know that I'm asking perhaps about the feeling and not about uh, knowledge, but uh, in essence, um, uh, my question aims at finding out uh, whether you see some, let's say, a territory for improvement uh, when it comes to international criminal law. Thank you. So maybe uh, first I will give advice to the Pro Liechtenstein, please. Yes, okay. So first to the concept, uh, European identity um, related to the EU. Of course, so the uh, Europe as a continent is much broader than the European Union. And um, it would be unfair to reduce European identity only to the European Union. Uh, but uh, within the European Union, uh, we must say that we have a political entity that needs a idea about identity that uh, generates togetherness and belonging of the populations and member states. So for the European Union, identity is an important concept and should be referred um, in this political sense as a resource for the European Union to this entity. Um, okay, uh, how uh, is European identity constructed? So the main purpose is to generate support of the populations in the member states and generate interest for European uh, union politics. Um, so European identity is basically constructed in national discourses and there we have the danger that um, we get different ideas about uh, European identity so that the European identity is filled with different meaning in different uh, nation states which can lead to identity conflicts. Um, it would be best that we have a European public sphere that we can negotiate different identity contents across borders in discussion of different countries. This happens, and for this purpose, also EU politics feels, has an important function because speeches of the EU Commission, so public appearances of uh, identity claims from EU politicians, can uh, trigger discourses and can trigger controversies about European identity that helps uh, member states to come into discussion about what is their shared collective identity and what is their shared collective memory that they can um, agree and on and take as a basis for togetherness and for belonging to the common community. I hope this was the answer to the question. Thank you. And now I would like to ask Professor Wilinski to maybe answer a question from Professor Balcerzak. Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Um, I believe Professor Balcerzak uh, probably heard something in between uh, the lines of my presentation. Uh, and that's why he asked about the disappointments. Obviously, yes, I am disappointed. And uh, probably every researcher uh, looking from the criminal law perspective at the evolution of international criminal law or criminal law from international perspective is disappointed. My main disappointment, except what I have said, which is the lack of uh, knowledge about the truth and lack of interest uh, to know the truth, 
is the political influence on the evolution of the international criminal law. We could get back to the old story of genocide and remember that in 1948, the definition of genocide was uh, slightly limited. And uh, that time, uh, the Soviet Union um, argued that the, the element of the definition saying that the genocide is also the, the crime committed against political and other groups it was uh, um, it was um, it was finally not within the definition um, of the uh, genocide. There was an amputation, I would say, of genocide definition. Why that happened? Because um, in some areas at that time, the term genocide had begun to be used to qualify the annexation of the Baltic countries by the Soviet Union and the intervention of Soviet Union to remove that element of the definition of genocide was recognized as a way of avoiding um, uh, uh, ju justice. Uh, if we look at the current politic of different big players in the international field, we can see that this politic influenced the international criminal law system very much. One example from European Union, one example from outside. The example from European Union and uh, something that uh, we can as European Union members uh, can be at least a shame is the role of European Union at the time of Yugoslavian conflict. It has never been um, really researched. There was and uh, there was a huge, huge uh, achievement, the tribunal, international tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. But he was focused on prosecuting the members of the conflict uh, from ex-Yugoslavian countries, almost all of them. However, we all know that the situation came that serious not only because of internal uh, um, interventions and tensions, but also um, was a result of lack of actions or other actions also taken by European Union as a uh, common wealth of European countries. And the case of uh, UN troops sent to Yugoslavia and their actions and the politics influences, influencing on the scale of their actions and protection that they could give or could not give uh, to civilians, even in Srebrenica, that have never been prosecuted. So when we speak about human rights, when we are so proud of our achievements, when we are so happy that we have so many documents, hundreds of uh, legal acts saying how we protect the human acts, we are not brave enough to um, research on that really deeply and say if there is anyone responsible for that. I have students from Belgium and I still remember one student a few years ago, she was crying she said that I have read about the Belgium uh, soldiers uh, being uh, members of the uh, UN and EU uh, troops uh, in uh, the territory of Yugoslavia during the conflict. And I, I read um, uh, the relations that they received, what they were not uh, allowed to do to protect the civilians. And, uh, uh, that is uh, something that should be really researched. And I don't see that anyone within the European Union is willing to do that, also ourselves. And that is a part of the um, answer for the same question. The, the, the information about true is not very common for the common, uh, uh, for, for the common European Union opinion. And that's why Europe doesn't have to focus on that. And the a second example from outside is mentioned uh, by me, the case of prosecution against uh, uh, prosecution of the case of Afghanistan. Once the prosecutor of the ICC uh, was willing to open the investigation in Afghanistan about the atrocities um, taking place in Afghanistan in uh, previous years, the first chamber of the ICC uh, that didn't allow to open the investigation, saying that because probably uh, 
a lot of evidence would be hard to to be reached because the intervention of uh, United States um, and the appearance of their soldiers during the conflict will appear in uh, lack of willing to cooperation with the ICC. So there is no interest of justice to open the investigation in Afghanistan. And um, I was um, amicus curia at this uh, hearing before the ICC last December because the appeal chamber was forced to answer the question whether the interest of justice is to open an investigation in Afghanistan or not. And it was obvious that uh, part of this answer is uh, the, 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 the decision about the future of the international criminal law. And part of that is a political answer given by the court, which is not and should be not a political body. And as we know, the, the court opened, uh, the, allowed the prosecutor to open the investigation, after which the United States um, presented or um, said that some serious consequences against judges of the ICC will be introduced. Um, so obviously, yes. However, um, if I may reverse the question to Professor Balcerak, I would uh, ask a short question. Is genocide a politically oriented crime from your international criminal law, pers a criminal, uh, international law perspective? Is this a politically oriented crime as you see that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wilinski. And of course, I'm turning the question to Professor Balcerak. Uh, thank you very much. Well, indeed, I was, um, I'm actually of the opinion that um, also commenting on the, on the, um, answer of Professor Linsky that, that the glass is indeed uh, half full, half empty. On the one side, we see that, uh, uh, of course, the development of um, uh, international criminal law and, uh, uh, well, the international criminal judiciary as such uh, it has been happening. Uh, but on the other hand, I also am quite worried uh, also um, for, for reasons which are actually the, the, the same about the future. We, we also know that there's much dissatisfaction, uh, for instance, on the part of the African continent that the attention of the ICC is very much focused on, on, on African states, which sometimes, which, which are considering leaving the system. And, uh, well, that's really would be um, devastating. And uh, that's just one of, of many problems. But uh, uh, trying to answer now the, the very interesting question, whether genocide is a politically oriented um, crime or, or not, um, uh, maybe uh, that question could be seen in the context of the 1948 convention and definitions because it's also, uh, it used to be, and it maybe still is, uh, a matter of discussion among uh, lawyers and not only lawyers, whether we should stick exactly um, and whether we should consider the, the definition of the 1948 convention as a well um, as a definition where which is universal valid and it is you know uh, no uh, possibility to, to, to develop it further because uh, also another thing is that uh, we are learned and we teach that uh, the law does not act uh, retroactively so what about this whole pre-1948 cases where you did have genocide of course and another thing is uh, whether you can, for instance, um, uh, whether you should or whether you can consider the, the crime of, of cutting as a, as a genocide, because some positivists would tell you then they're not. But if you take the idea of genocide, if you consider it as a certain um, legal, uh, but also political, indeed, uh, construct, then, then of course, yes. Uh, but the answer to whether or not it is politically oriented, um, I would argue that mm, in a way it is, mm, but uh, we should, I think, as lawyers, international lawyers, international criminal lawyers, mm, we should take every possible precaution and, and take steps to, to try to see that uh, indeed also as a, 
and then see it from perspective also of the effective persecution, effectiveness of the 1948 convention as such. Um, I'm saying that uh, in essence, um, I would very much like to see it in strictly legal context, but that's not the only, the only place in the system uh, where some, um, some political um, influence is indeed uh, visible. And um, so the answer would be that, in fact, it, it has been and it is also used, the concept of genocide, the crime of genocide is used in sometimes in, in political debate and for, for purposes which are not exactly um, directly linked with the, um, the idea of individual communal responsibility. In other words, um, myself, I would prefer and I would be in favor of considering it in purely legal terms and to use it as it was designed for, for persecuting the perpetrators and also for preserving certain memory of it. Let's not forget about this aspect. And, um, the international law as such and the, uh, also um, conventions 1948 and others were, I think, also um, developed and opened for signature and ratified uh, for, well, let's recall it, for the simple reason to uh, prevent a recurrence, to prevent other uh, instances. Professor Wilinski mentioned uh, many examples where international community failed. Obviously, that's, that's very sad. The Srebrenica is one of the many examples. Uh, now, very disturbing news come also, for instance, from Ethiopia, Eritrea, and etc. Um, and we had Rwanda and, and so on. So, uh, post-1948 uh, world um, also um, Seems, seems to be um, a disappointment in that, that respect. Uh, um, the the, the, the post-war world, uh, we would hope that uh, learned something from the events of the 1940s and, and before. Uh, but uh, again, to, uh, to conclude, I'd like to, to, to stress that uh, we, would, we are pro probably not able to isolate the concept of genocide from any um, political influence whatsoever, but I think it depends how we perceive our role in this process. I mean, uh, lawyers would probably or should um, indeed, uh, well, explain this concept along 1948 convention and should uh, do what they can to, um, to ensure that it is effectively implemented. But also, on the other hand, I wouldn't be surprised that political scientists, that sociologists, that historians would like to prefer, would like to use this concept and this term also in the framework of, of their um, research and, and their uh, narratives. Uh, and uh, well, um, lastly, I'm not sure if the concept of genocide can be owned only by lawyers. I mean, I believe that we should, uh, again, as lawyers, this is where we are, this is the world that we know. But if I'm trying now to think um, of being in the shoes of a historian or so sociologist, can we um, expect and demand that they would see this concept exactly and only in legal terms? Probably not. So that would be my answer and I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Balcerzak. And now maybe I would have a question, a question to Dr. Liechtenstein, because you said something that uh, caught my interest in your presentation. At the beginning, you said that uh, to the, according to the European Union, uh, Holocaust uh, approach to the Holocaust is the approach of shared guilt. And you also mentioned that does not re adequately represent the feelings of all the European Union countries. And this is actually something uh, 
very controversial because, of course, when we compare, for example, the memory of this, those events from the perspective of Germany with the perspective of Poland, we have a totally different approaches and the one of shared guilt might not be adequate to, uh, for example, for Poland. And therefore, I would like to ask you, what do you think uh, European Union actually can do about it? Should uh, the one approach, those of shared guilt should be enforced or maybe should be an, an other way so that this, uh, this proportion between countries will not be so visible? Yeah, so I think um, it will not be possible to um, create a unique and totally homogeneous European identity. And this also should not be as a purpose. So if you have a homogeneous European uh, identity, then no country will feel uh, connected to this anymore. Um, so it's good that we have different perceptions um, of uh, European identity and European history. But it's important that we uh, don't have um, that's a still point that uh, go together and are related to each other. So it is, from my perspective, it's important to um, create a European memory that is, does not divide the countries. And so we have important steps. We have also a common uh, memory on the end of the war between Germany and France. This was a, was a very big step. And this um, common memory and um, it's a big success. It should also be possible uh, together with the Eastern European states. Um, yes, and I think uh, this uh, idea about um, the Holocaust as a kind of shared guilt, of course, so the main guilt will still be with Germany. But when other countries say they take a little bit of this, it can be a common um, memorial on uh, these events and uh, common agreement on that we must prevent that this will happen again. And it will not be uh, this kind of history that divides the country. So this is the important thing. Thank you very much for this explanation. And maybe we'll have a time for one quick question. So I would have a question to Professor Wiliski because you also mentioned in your speech about those victors justice of, uh, for example, Nuremberg trials and how it influenced the international law. Do you think this fact that that was uh, the victors justice of such a big and uh, tragic event of the European history is still influencing the international law and still uh, influencing how we perceive it? Or is it something that uh, only happened in that moment of time? Uh, uh, yes, thank you for um, this question. Yes, I was thinking about these for many years. Um, first, I thought obviously not because it's too far away. Many decades have passed. However, then I thought about this um, shadow feeling that I have mentioned. And um, I think it is this way that this um, failure to bring justice and failure to prosecute those um, perpetrators for the most cruel crimes committed on massive scale. It leaves um, this um, shadow feeling amongst the victims. However, amongst those that have never been put before justice and the others that have interest in that, that this shame or the shadow of shame should not follow after them and they are interested, maybe not that much in prosecuting, that they receive a lesson that if this, uh, sometimes the scale of atrocities is a reason why the justice cannot be done, but sometimes, and I've read something like this, when this is so massive scale, it's also an effective way of avoiding responsibility. So, I believe, yes, before, because we had this victor's justice and it was just um, a, one small tip of justice, a, a bit, a bite of justice, and the, the, the rest was never put before justice. This feeling that you can avoid justice from one side and the feeling that you cannot receive justice 
have a uh, very big influence on the evolution of international criminal law. Again, on the field of big players playing for their own interests. And that is um, also um, answer to Professor Balcerak comments. That I agree with him that the genocide and other crimes, or crimes against humanity and war crimes, or now environmental crimes recognized are internationally oriented crimes, are not only obviously the legal uh, perspective uh, something, but this is uh, our common uh, problem that we have to share the, the, from all uh, other perspectives. However, on us, I mean lawyers, there is a special responsibility of bringing the tools and effective tools for the society, for international community, for European Union also, um, and bring the knowledge about the accidents that should be uh, taken into uh, consideration. That once it is obviously known that something like these kind of atrocities have happened. And once they realize that we have uh, tools uh, to deal with these, to bring justice, then the international community can just uh, go forward and bring this justice to, uh, to people. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wilinski, and actually thank you for all the speakers. Uh, our session came to an end, unfortunately, we'll now have a little bit of a longer lunch break and at 1.30 p.m. we will see each other on the session this time, uh, dedicated to more national level. Thank you so much and goodbye.